Well, welcome to all of you out there, those in our uh, we audience here in Alumni Hall at King's College, and especially to the multitude of those watching this live on the Upstream uh, website and YouTube. My name is Gordon McCuit, and I am the director of the History of Science and Technology program here at the University of King's College. I also teach in the Contemporary Studies program at King's College. And every year, the History of Science program, which is a, uh, a program that studies the relationship of science, technology, and, uh, the, uh, and society, uh, puts on with partners, including Contemporary Studies and Upstream Music, uh, uh, show a live uh, performance of a significant silent film, along with live musical uh, performance. You might have come to some of them in the past. We have shown Metropolis, Anita, the uh, Queen of Mars, and uh, Haikam, the uh, uh, Witchcraft. Uh, this year, we're teaming up with Upstream Music to give you, live with a musical accompaniment, the classic expressionist film, De Gollum, of 1920. So this is the 100th anniversary. We're pleased to have introducing the film two experts in the field. Dr. Lisa Skatolsky, who is the Simon and Riva Spatz Visiting Chair in Jewish Studies at Dalhousie, housed over in the Philosophy Department, and Dr. Stephen Snobelin, my colleague and professor in the History of Science and Technology program. They'll give a very short introductions to the film and to the context, and then we'll follow by the live streaming of the film uh, with uh, a musical accompaniment. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Skatolsky, who will be speaking on the golem and racial anxiety of European Jews. Dr. Skatolsky. Cool with the mic. Uh, I'm so thrilled to be here. It's also a really nice distraction from the upcoming American election. I'm a newly proud American expat, so happy to be living in Halifax right now. I want to thank Dr. Stephen Snobelin for putting on this uh, really exciting event. This is a film that can be seen and interpreted through many different lenses, and each lens suggests a different way to understand the meaning of the golem, or the terrestrial creature that is the subject of Jewish folklore. In the film, the golem is represented as a creature monster that is conjured by a rabbi in a last-ditch effort to save his community from expulsion, suffering, and death. In the film, the rabbi creates the golem in the effort to impress the aristocracy by illustrating the special powers of the Jewish people in order to persuade them to revoke their hasty and callous decision to expel and destroy them. If we look at the film through the lens of the plot alone, it appears to be about the desperate efforts of one particular minority group to defend itself against state-sanctioned violence inflicted by privileged, feckless, and cruel rich dudes who play dice with human lives. And that, as we know, is a real horror story from which we have not escaped. However, this is a movie written and directed by non-Jews that depicts the Jewish people as a strange and ethnically ambiguous group, a sort of foreign nation within the nation. And so through this lens, the film appears to reinforce certain stereotypes about the Jews as a primitive and problematic group who refuse to assimilate to the norms of civilized culture, and so who perpetually threaten the cultural cohesion and progress of the nation. And this depiction reinforces certain stereotypes about Jews as provincial, backward, superstitious, and dangerous that rationalized 
both anti-Jewish sentiment and state violence against Jewish communities in the medieval and modern era. So one way of seeing these stereotypical tropes in the film is to remind ourselves that we are seeing the Jews through a non-Jewish lens, which often mistakes the effects of our long history of persecution and constant vulnerability to expulsion as the very causes for our persecution. That is, if many Jewish communities appear to be insular and resist assimilation and remain wary of cultural norms, it's as a result of perpetual displacement, discrimination, and mass death suffered as a result of those norms. So for this reason, it's important to keep in mind that Jewish history itself is characterized by Jews in diaspora, scattered around the world and stateless, always granted temporary residence in a country under compromised conditions until suddenly they would be thrown out by the whims of a fickle leader. I can't provide a definitive explanation for the source of anti-Jewish sentiment or the modern genocidal intent that gave rise to Nazism. But we do trace it back to early Christian history and view religious animosity toward the Jews as the first form of anti-Semitism. It is really hard to understand why the early Christians hated the Jews so much, uh, but I do think it's incredibly helpful to quote one of our greatest sages, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, from an essay he wrote that speaks to this very question. Rabbi Heschel explains the source of Christian anti-Judaism in terms of a process that also began in early Christian history, namely, quote, the conscious or unconscious de-Judaization of Christianity, affecting the church's way of thinking, its inner life, as well as its relationship to the past and present reality of Israel, the father and mother of the very being of Christianity. The children did not arise to call the mother blessed. Instead, they called the mother blind. Some theologians continue to act as if they did not know the meaning of honor your, mother, your father and mother. Others, anxious to prove the superiority of the church, speak as if they suffered from a spiritual Oedipus complex. I just think that's one of the most beautiful and profound statements I've ever heard about the origin or source of anti-Jewish sentiment in early Christian history. So, given uh, this very long history of persecution, how we are actually still around uh, is a really interesting question. And of course, I actually have no idea. But it is the case that historically, we have always attempted to adapt to the constantly changing terms of our social and political acceptance through redefining ourselves and the meaning of our doctrines. These efforts to reinterpret the meaning of our values, commitments, and identity occur on the religious, secular, and aesthetic levels all at the same time. In fact, we have a distinct form of rabbinical interpretation called responsa that provides guidance about how to reinterpret and reshape Jewish ethics in light of unprecedented circumstances. So I think it's significant that the survival of the Jewish people has coincided with narratives that we forge in order to save ourselves. However, our efforts to assimilate through redefining ourselves have also had tragic and traumatic consequences when our narratives are used against us as new tools in the arsenal of anti-Semitic ideology. One of the more recent and traumatic examples relates to the efforts of some European Jews to redefine and promote Judaism as a race, both before and after World War I, in an attempt to achieve the conflicting goals of assimilation through their distinction from religious, traditional Eastern European Jews and remaining exotic enough to be valued and of interest to aristocrats. 
The most famous proponent of this view, that Judaism is a race, was the British statesman Benjamin Disraeli, who died in 1881, and who twice served as prime minister of the UK, which was an absolutely unprecedented position for a Jew to attain at the time, although I would like to remind us that we haven't had a Jewish prime minister of the UK since, so that's kind of interesting, I was thinking today. Maybe that was the last time. Okay, but Disraeli was actually baptized as a child, but once he rose to prominence as a politician, found himself having to defend himself against anti-Semitic accusations. In 1847, he published a novel called Tancred, or The New Crusade, in which the Jewish protagonist believes he can find inspiration in the Holy Land, but before he departs, he asks the advice of his friend Sidonia, who critiques his belief by explaining that when it comes down to Judaism, quote, it is an affair of race. And when a superior race with a superior idea to work and order advances, its state will be progressive. And we shall perhaps follow the example of the desolate countries. All is race, there is no other truth. And this provides yet another lens through which we can interpret the plot of the golem. As we can see, the recreation of Judaism as a race, a recreation meant to save us as a golem that came back to destroy us. So when I watch this film, I can see the golem as a product of our anxiety about how to be Jewish in a world in which white Jews still occupy a tenuous position in which sometimes, for some reasons, we are seen as not quite white enough. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to speak tonight, and I hope that you enjoy the film. My name is uh, Steve Snoblin. I teach in the History of Science and Technology program. It's uh, my job to look at this amazing film on precisely its 100th anniversary uh, tonight through the lens of the history of uh, science. I'm also going to say a little bit about uh, its place in the history of uh, science fiction. Uh, so here is the title of the film in the uh, German and the English, The Golem, How He Came Into the World. Uh, 1920, and I want to say something about the golem. And what we're seeing right here are uh, artistic uh, depictions of the golem. In fact, there's a male and a female golem here, and that is the female golem. And there you see on the right the male golem, on the left uh, the female golem. So these are clay creations uh, that Rabbi Lowe uh, in 16th century Prague in order to save his community from a pogrom or, or uh, from some kind of pressure, there are various versions of uh, the, the story, pressure on the community, creates this golem, and it looks like a human, but it's somehow less than human. It doesn't have a soul, it's mute, it can't talk, uh, and it's very uh, robotic. Uh, now, you can see on their foreheads uh, Hebrew letters, uh, Aleph, uh, Mame and Tau, and then it's not very visible, but on the, at the very top, uh, the, the letter Sheen, uh, Sheen uh, which is uh, Hashem, the, the divine name. Uh, what are these letters? What do they do? Uh, so all three of them, they spell out uh, the word Amet, uh, which is truth. But when the rabbi wants to deactivate the golem, uh, he will uh, erase that first letter, uh, the Aleph, and then it spells death. So in effect, this is a kill switch, and it's very, very important with this kind of technology that you have a kill switch. It's really interesting to see this uh, hundreds of years ago. Uh, this is the uh, synagogue at, at Prague. It, it still survives. Um, I've seen a model of it uh, in Tel Aviv in Israel. Uh, bizarrely, the Nazis uh, wanted to preserve it because they argued that after all the Jews were wiped out, they wanted to have some kind of 
uh, legacy, a museum of, of Jewry. It's twisted, it's bizarre, it's evil, uh, but that's uh, why the synagogue uh, survives. Now, one, of the, one version of the story is that the rabbi took the deactivated golem and put it up in the, uh, in the attic of this, uh, of this synagogue. Uh, this is one of the uh, posters for uh, the movie. I want to just situate uh, this film. Uh, Gordon has already referred to uh, expressionism. Uh, here's a nice definition. What characterizes the ascetic most distinctly is a tendency for artists to focus on the level of the abstract by being overt, by uh, using overt and concrete symbols to convey emotional truths. Uh, Siegfried Krapper's lengthy cultural analysis on expressionism, nature, and meaning of a contemporary movement identifies the ascetic as the outcry of those who felt enslaved by modernity's instrumental reason, realism with its attention to detail, tacitly affirmed the stifling reality, while expressionism challenged the status quo by breaking with conventional practices of representation in the arts. In other words, reason and instrumentality, which had brought about the rise of industrialism and war, had proved for many to be the most irrational elements of modern reality. The dilemmas, fears, and sense of distress that plagued the post-war population in Germany and other northern European nations often took shape in, on the expressionist canvas stage or screen in haunted landscapes or fantastic forms. Who is the monster among us? These works appear to ask, and how do we regain control of the uncontrollable? Uh, one important thing to note in terms of the history of science fiction is the probability that the Golem story uh, in the Brothers Grimm compilation was known to Mary Shelley, who in 1818, at the very young age of around 20, uh, helps invent the genre of science fiction in uh, Frankenstein or the modern uh, Prometheus. Uh, you can, if you go to Prague, you can find models, uh, little figurines of the Golem. There is a drawing with the uh, Hebrew letters. So um, from the point of view of the history of, of, of science, um, and the, the study of science uh, fiction. Uh, there are three ways of approaching this myth. Uh, one, a Jewish legend with archetypal uh, religious and literary themes, and so Lissa's is already uh, uh, engaged with that. Uh, number two, as a foundation myth of science fiction, I just mentioned Frankenstein, uh, the creature of Frankenstein. And number three, as a metaphor for science, technology, and medicine. And so Collins and Pinch, in their book now in the second edition, uh, the golem, make the case that science is like a golem. It's kind of amorphous. It needs to be controlled. Uh, there are ethical implications of creating uh, uh, technology. They've applied this to medicine. They've also applied it uh, to uh, technology. And here, in an article that um, Trevor Pinch uh, published a few years ago, uh, he makes this argument. What are we to make of science? Unquestionably, science is the most powerful means of generating and authorizing knowledge available today. Yet debates about its fundamental character are remarkably polarized. Beleaguered scientists warn humanist scholars not to historicize science. Do not turn your deconstructionist techniques on us, they beg the humanists, or all will be lost down the slippery slope to relativism. And even though science delivers the goods, witness agricultural self-sufficiency, cures for many major illnesses, and the global communication network, more and more voices are challenging science's taken for granted superiority. We are urged to storm the scientific citadel and see science for what it is, a male conspiracy of dubious knowledge aligned with capitalism and wrecking havoc on our peaceful and gentle earth. Witness the silent spring and nuclear winter. The flip-flop thinking about science, that it is either all good or all bad, is itself an impediment to serious and sensible thought about the nature of science. Defenders and critics alike fall into the trap of seeing science as being about either certainty or contingency. Modern science studies calls for a new way of viewing science that goes beyond the old dichotomy. Science has neither the personality of a chivalrous knight nor a Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein. In The Golem, what everyone should know about science, Harry Collins and I argue for a new science studies metaphor to understand science. A golem is a hybrid creature of Jewish mythology made out of clay by human hands. We've talked about this. A golem is strong as long as we realize it is built by us a product of our art, our craft. But a golem is also clumsy and dangerous. Without control, it can destroy its masters. Science as an activity is golem-like, and we should realize the bumbling giant for what it is. Science becomes 
a dangerous monster only when its human origins are forgotten. I want to conclude with uh, the second uh, digital computer in Israel. Uh, the first one, the, the Weizsac, uh, went, uh, um, was, uh, became operational in 1954. Uh, this one, uh, I won't tell you the year, but it's exactly as old as I am. Um, and it was uh, named by the Kabbalistic scholar Gershom Sholem, uh, the Golem. And you can see the nameplate there. It is in Hebrew and uh, in uh, the English. And this is what he said uh, when he uh, dedicated, and he was given the privilege to dedicate this uh, computer, uh, which had been uh, set up by the lab of Chaim Pekaris. All my days I have complaining that the Weizmann Institute has not mobilized the funds to build up the Institute for Experimental Demonology and Magic, <laughs> tongue in cheek, which I have for so long proposed to establish there. They preferred what they call applied mathematics and its sinister possibilities to my more direct magical approach. Little did they know when they preferred Chaim Pekaris to me, what they were letting themselves in for. So I resign myself and say to the golem and its creator, develop peacefully and don't destroy the world. Shalom. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Lissa. Now I want to introduce musicians, or have Lucas Pierce actually introduce the musicians. This is the upstream quartet who will be providing the live music here with all these electronics uh, to the golem. Lucas Pierce. Leave it there. Good. Thanks, uh, uh, thanks Gordon, and thanks for these uh, insightful uh, introductions to this fascinating film. Um, my name is Lucas Pierce. I'm the artistic director of the Upstream Music Association, an organization dedicated in Halifax for 31 years to new and improvised music. I have both with Upstream and without Upstream uh, been happy to participate in numerous uh, silent film scoring events here, and it's always a pleasure to return. Uh, Upstream is uh, it's made possible by the support of donors such as the Canada Council for the Arts, Arts Nova Scotia, the SOCAN Foundation, and the Craig Foundation, the City of Halifax, and um, Lyle Sully Davidson. And really what makes it possible is the great musicians in Halifax that we have to work with. So I'd like to introduce the group that we have playing today. We're going to have um, John Hatfield on Woodwinds. We will have Jordy Haley on electric guitar. We will have Andrew Miller on drums. And I will be playing a fretless bass. And we are, all have a little bit more stuff than we would normally take to an average gig because it's a, it's a soundtrack. And there's a lot of room for creating uh, other relationships between sounds. I think that there's this fascinating relationship with creating a soundtrack to a film that didn't initially have a specific one because of the dialogue that we get to enter into between the visual events and the sound events, both those that might be related to what we see on screen and those that might be creating an atmosphere or a subtext or a commentary on what's going on. And this lets uh, musicians, especially improvising musicians, work in a different way than they might if they were only playing music for the sake of playing music. And this um, tradition of improvising with silent films is really part of what silent films did. We're not trying to reproduce the, um, 19, the teens and 20s uh, uh, piano player tropes that uh, where the piano players were often uh, given a short list of themes they might very make variations on and often play the piano film unseen and the film might play for a week or two and that they would gradually get used to it and figure out things to happen. But I really find fascinating is that those first times that the musicians would deal with the film, some pe um, there's relationships between the visual events and the sonic events that cannot be planned and sometimes that's incredibly magical. Uh, among us, some of us have seen the film, some of us, including myself, have seen the film quite a few times, others have not seen it at all, and that creates a really interesting dynamic to work between as musicians. 
ourselves. So thank you for uh, tuning in. Thank you to the small audience who is here. And uh, thank you to uh, Gordon and Stephen and our uh, visiting lecturer. And um, thanks for paying attention to the, their golem. Please enjoy it.